Join us now to build the universal currency we've been waiting for. It's, uh, basically, I think that's where the future grows. In fact, uh, when we started this project, when I left my fund in 2018, early 2018, and started the year project, we actually named our company as the Decentralized Finance Lab. Um, to be honest, I actually feel the current narrative of store value is kind of uh, more harmful than good than uh, for the crypto world. Because uh, if you think about the store value, at the end of the day, you're competing on uh, social consensus. Essentially, how many people are believing uh, the value uh, of this uh, of this item? And uh, the upside is actually the ceiling disparity is actually pretty low. For example, if you are thinking uh, about uh, gold, so we have seven billion people in the consensus in the value of gold, and the market cap is around so a trillion dollars. And right now, if we look at crypto, we have about like, 20 to 30 million uh, users. And uh, we have about a uh, quarter trillion uh, market cap. If you compare that level of consensus, it's actually fully valuable, right? I would say a lot of the future potential outside is already valuable. In addition, under this narrative, only Bitcoin will survive. Because why do we need so many different uh, uh, store of value? The only thing that uh, actually can explain such a valuation is actually rebuilding fully decentralized financial systems. And that's why uh, today we organized this conference, basically bringing in the soft leadership uh, in the industry, both on the project side and on the investment side, to discuss where we are, the current state of decentralized finance, and brainstorm where we're going in the future. So I will explain the agenda a little bit. Uh, so first, uh, I will give a presentation of the year. So a quick uh, overview of the year. Basically, you can imagine us as a permissionless uh, So, and then you know, permissionless, what it means is uh, instead of trusting uh, Mark, or a couple of uh, rich guys uh, invited by Mark, um, you are actually are giving the right of currency creation back to the people. Everyone uh, can create an achievable unit of account in our system. Um, and uh, basically, this is also a stable unit. Uh, so I will talk more about this uh, on the presentation. Then we have uh, two great uh, panelists, both from the builder side and from the investor side. Uh, basically, yeah, so this is uh, uh, from the project side. And we have a uh, great uh, panelist from the investment side as well. And after that, we have uh, three presentations uh, from Anchor, from Baker and the Calvin from Hong Kong. Finally, uh, Maria from Electric Capital will talk about uh, the current activities of uh, the developers in the crypto ecosystem. So, uh, hope uh, everyone will enjoy this afternoon of uh, discussions and uh, presentations. And uh, we look forward to build uh, the future decentralized financial system together. Here. What exactly is uh, decentralized business? 
So we, we, these are the businesses uh, where basically all the business activity happens on chain. Essentially, all your revenues, your expenses happens on chain. And also, like your early adopters, investors, will have full transparency and understand what's going on in the business instead of worrying about the like the funny, like the funny trips. So that removes the friction. That helps entrepreneurs to uh, easily raise more capital and uh, my investors have more uh, assurance that um, there's nothing, they say they have good understanding of what they are investing in. So, um, and the examples of these are decentralized business, uh, very good examples of, for example, decentralized uh, exchanges, where all the revenue that happens on chain. And uh, you're running services, uh, you can run services on chain as well, and uh, you can create virtual assets, you can create apps. These are all perfect examples of decentralized businesses. And uh, in order to grow the decentralized financial system, we actually what we need is actually uh, attracting values from the physical world and permanently move these values into the virtual world more on the chain. So essentially, uh, uh, there's for example proof of work. Uh, you spend also you spend time, you can spend uh, labor, you can spend the uh, example coding time running uh, validators. These are all perfect examples of moving uh, values in the physical world to the crypto world. Uh, there are examples like, for example, you're tokenizing physical assets, but tokenizing physical assets doesn't mean you're actually moving these values on chain. The value still stays off chain. Just like, for example, if you ship a gold bar to FedEx, you're not really putting the value of gold bar to FedEx. Only the shipping fee goes to the FedEx and how the how FedEx to grow. So that's the key differentiation. So that's very different. Uh, and like, I would say, um, tokenizing physical assets is more like a, a tourist economy. So basically, things can go on and off chain very quickly. Just like, for example, uh, fiat, you have stable coins uh, on, the, on chain. And these stable coins can immediately swap the back to uh, fiat. So these guys can go in and out of the crypto very easily. So they are really. And they, there are fees out of the crypto world as well, but they are not really uh, transferring all the value to the crypto world. And what we have learned in the past uh, 10 years is running these decentralized businesses is really tough. For example, first you will have to face the uh, user experience issue. Right? So crypto is not uh, particularly user friendly, and that's the same many projects are working on to solve. And also, uh, you realize. This is a tough economy as well, because the overall economy is a deflationary economy. So deflationary economy fundamentally is actually uh, preventing long-term production and investment. So think about if I'm running a business, I have expenses, I spend uh, currencies. My goal is to set my value, and later I can swap for more currencies. But such an assumption doesn't really work in the deflationary economy. If I'm a baker, I purchase a flower, and uh, tomorrow when I sell, okay, the currency that will exchange for will be less than what I pay. So why are you doing things? Why not just follow? And finally, uh, also there is a fat protocol continuing to do. So basically, the fat protocol is talking about uh, the protocol layer is actually extracting most of the value from the system. But if you think about it, if all the value went to the protocol layer, the platform layer, and who has incentives to build anything on top of such a network system? But essentially, we keep competing with the network system. So we don't feel um, that's the right approach. So basically, um, what Meter is trying to do is, uh, we're trying to do three things. First, we want to create a, a good uh, decentralized uh, crypto native currency that doesn't compete uh, with the uh, financial assets running in the system. And also, it has enough capacity security and also censorship resistance. And then we want to address the performance problem in the system. But we thought introducing additional usability issues. Like for example, sharding actually includes uh, user usability issues as well because you're introducing new concepts, new learning curves. And finally, we want to be able to interact with uh, existing uh, crypto silos, uh, connecting all those values together. So basically, people may have questions. Uh, so let's first talk about uh, building a good currency, crypto-native currency. So why not uh, just uh, putting fiat on the chain? So that 
that's a stable point. But uh, first, we will talk about this uh, before. Um, basically, moving just a fiat on chain doesn't necessarily increase the value of the crypto financial system. And also, there are still centralized control by the government. There's a lot of compliance issues as well. And then there is, uh, for example, crypto collateralized uh, um, approaches. Uh, basically, we're still packing the fiat. Uh, and also, there's capacity issues and also potential uh, oracle issues uh, that people are still working on. And these are open problems to solve. Uh, actually, uh, like Nate from Nico will talk about how to address the capacity issues, for example, in the later discussion. So, if you look at the problem, actually, it's a perfect international finance problem. So we have two economies. We have the physical world and we have the crypto world. Uh, the physical world exports computation and energy to the crypto world. And the crypto world uh, exports the financial products, essentially cryptocurrencies, to the physical world. And this is like a trading between two economy, uh, economies, and it has to follow all the uh, international uh, economy rules. There's a famous uh, like impossible trinity in international finance. Essentially, fixed exchange theory, free flow of capital, and independent monetary policy. This reason is all exist at the same time. So in order to create a fiat path, there's only two ways to do it. There's a Chinese way. Basically, you do not have a lot of free flow of capital. Obviously, we don't like that. And there's a Hong Kong way. Basically, you have 100% reserve in the fiat factory in a single pool, and you provide them basically like a uh, hard uh, recovery. So then you can keep the path. Um, but fundamentally, whatever you do, there's always something better than that's the fiat itself. Um, and also, like the, if you're just uh, doing the fiat system, there's already a system that's pretty efficient. That's an existing financial system. Why do you have to bring that to build? And, but like, if we think about this issue, if we give up on the fixed exchange rate and just take the other two uh, points, basically this one happens and independent monetary policy, we can actually fulfill the country's uh, original vision, create a uh, uh, currency that's made in the world. Uh, it's a uh, have a good uh, uh, probability and characteristic of uh, good currency. So, if you look at the two worlds, the only link for the strongest link between the two worlds uh, two for work, mining. So miner basically for them is very simple. They are profit driven. Uh, for them, they are like the uh, traders on the swing road between the eastern and western world. So their income is all in the crypto world, in the block of world and transaction fees. And their expenses are all in the physical world, capex and uh, no tax. And if you look at the highly competitive environment, at the end of the day, only old tax has These old tax are basically essentially the electricity costs burned by uh, overworked land. And if we use cash rate as a proxy for uh, energy miner has burned uh, uh, during uh, overworked land. So basically, this uh, two charts shows a big point in the ceremony. So uh, the solid line uh, market price and the dollar lines are the hash rate. We can see there's a very very strong correlation between the two, which is explainable. Basically, um, when the price rises, miners have more incentive to buy more. And uh, basically, the competition will drive marginal cost equal to marginal revenue, which is uh, basically the uh, microeconomics. And we also notice uh, that it's a different time frame. There's actually different, uh, uh, basically, efficiencies of mining power. And if we adjust for that efficiency uh, factor, we actually run a different regression. So in this uh, chart, the blue line has the market size of Bitcoin, and the green line has the uh, full tax or uh, basically variable cost for miners. So we can actually explain 85% of the market price of Bitcoin to basically um, the cost of production. And the majority of the deviation actually happens at the end of 2017. So at that time, like, uh, we actually have a lot of force going on in Bitcoin. So we can say the valuation expectation is kind of screwed at the time. So by uh, observing this, we realize that we can actually leverage miners' powerful chasing behavior to create uh, economic feedback into the system. So that's how we uh, have the uh, meter currency up there. So basically, uh, meter currency is very simple. So in order to create a one meter 
currency, the amount of electricity you burn, and so forth, of course, is on average always the same. So, the, for example, set as uh, 10 kilowatt of electricity. So, basically, it does create uh, more like a fixed the cost of production for the energy. And uh, if all of the uh, points are basically uh, created in an equalized fashion,
Yeah, so basically, uh, we really is not the consensus uh, in terms of currency. So we're separating the uh, currency equation and the private key. So basically, uh, here, uh, proof of work has three functions. Basically, uh, creating currency, creating motion of time, and also one source of permanence. And then uh, we have a proof of uh, state chain. Basically, uh, the same tokens that were uh, about this one that I mentioned earlier. So these two chains will basically cause reference each other and put the transaction in a normal loop on each other. So basically, uh, to prevent uh, that, uh, 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 all that behind uh, that type of issues. And on the proof of stake side, basically, you can have a big pool of validators. You can randomly select uh, a big community out of the bigger pool. For targeting, you can have uh, like a solid uh, validator, center validator pool. And every time it's going to pick out a couple of hundreds of uh, uh, validators, and we change this on a regular basis. And every block, we can change the, uh, the meters, basically, to uh, create a, like, enough of, uh, changes in the system to prevent uh, like attacks and uh, uh, censorship. So, because we're running this, actually, we can run uh, record keeping very efficiently, very quickly. So, basically, um, after we did this, we realized that we can actually combine the benefits of both worlds. So, for example, if you look at the of work planning, uh, one of the complaints is basically wasting a lot of energy. If you think about the big one in Serbia, so the majority of the energy basically, uh, and it's, uh, the, the economics works like basically the amount of pressure in the system directly correlates to the price of big one in Serbia, or the market cap of big one in Serbia. Uh, but in our system, basically, it correlates to the increment of the market cap instead of the market cap itself. So we actually did a calculation. In order to support the U.S. economy, the size of growth, the amount of electricity we burn annually is actually similar to, basically, the uh, annual budget of the uh, U.S. Uh, mint and U.S. Burger printing can be as efficient as uh, here. And also, it's a completely permissionless system. Everyone can basically start mining to participate in the network. And because of what we're using for the states, we can run transactions very quickly and efficiently. We're targeting basically uh, 3 to 5 seconds uh, block period with the 2,000 uh, second uh, transaction per second uh, when we launch. And this can be like uh, arbitrarily scaled uh, up by adding more side chains and things like that. And also, when we are doing this, we can prevent uh, some of the difficult problems that people complain about the state. For example, like bridge got richer, like uh, you own a lot of coins and you mint uh, these coins with uh, your staking token, and it's very hard to get decentralized. So I would describe how we solve this problem in our token distribution model. Um, and then one of the hardest problems for the state is uh, basically monitoring the tax. So uh, if you own a lot of tokens, later you sell it all the time, and you don't like the system, you can actually go back to the genesis and recreate another chain. There's no way to differentiate which one is real, which one is fake. So basically, uh, because we have the, like a two heterogeneous chain and cross empty on each other, so it's becoming impossible to go back at the same time. And also, by doing this, we actually completely separate the interest of miners and the uh, developers and stakeholders. Basically, on the state side, we can continuously innovate without the uh, basically running into uh, confrontations of this finance. So about how we distribute the, uh, the staking token. So basically, um, we run uh, more like a Dutch auction uh, periodically at the time of fashion. Uh, for example, let's say every day there's a certain amount of uh, uh, staking the government's token or we release on chain. And then in order to participate uh, uh, in this auction. The only way you can participate is using the proof of work token, basically the currency token. So basically, that's actually the first use case of the currency token as well. Uh, and the proceed of the uh, auction, a portion of them will be directly burned, so this will create a continuous demand in the system for currency. And then even, for example, if there's a certain period of time, there's oversupply of uh, the currency token, this burning process will basically remove the token from circulation. And then, uh, 
we will have more when we uh, put into a stability fund and gradually distribute it uh, to the validators as one of the worst. And also, as a token holder, you can have other ways, for example, to borrow against the stability funds. And then we can go into the data and layer and more detail uh, offline. So basically, We actually do our setup as a basic tool for all the existing public chains and others. For example, from the Zerman's perspective, uh, there will be no difference uh, from here to a uh, plasma chain. Uh, and also, basically, uh, it's similar, we have similar mechanisms working with uh, interactions and uh, points. And basically, the goal is to basically uh, connecting all the different uh, silos and uh, bringing them down together. That's one of the things that we want to work on. And basically, at this stage, because uh, our testnet is also uh, is already fully functioning, running stable for about like, two months, um, basically there's already some hardware miners and mining on our testnet. We'll provide a full version for mining tokens from testnet to mainnet. And our testnet already has fully serving support. So basically, uh, if there's any developers interested, Basically, working on this uh, piece of research. And also, uh, we are launching basically a validator again for this one. So, basically, if any of you guys are running any validators, please reach out as well. And we will figure out, we'll have a way to get the big one users to basically start using the DeFi applications from the testnet as well. And also, we are running an ambassador program. So, if any of you are interested in uh, gathering data as well, Developer communities, uh, please reach out as well. And uh, thanks a lot uh, um, for listening to the talk. Thank you. 